Afternoon again, everybody. So we're going to be carrying on our theme about trust and identity. And our next speaker is going to take us into a world and talk about self-sovereign identity, the true meaning of identity. I'm super excited to have our next speaker on stage. She's actually one of the, the only people, there's a few people, that have a master's in trust and identity. She's currently consulting with a number of governments and organizations and NGOs around the topic of identity. Now, I'm co-founder of Women in Identity. My next guest on is called Kalia Young. She is also a woman in identity. But she has a pseudo-identity, which is actually Identity Woman, which is her ticker on Twitter if you want to follow her. So I'm going to pass over and hand over to Kalia Young now, who's going to talk you through the true meaning of identity and let her tell you the story initially about how she became known as Identity Woman. Kalia, please join me on stage. Thank you, Emma. So um, I ended up with the handle Identity Woman because in 2005, when our community looking at user-centric identity was beginning to gather, one of the leaders went around and asked everybody to start a blog. And you needed a good name for your blog. And I was the only woman I'd ever met at one of those all-day meetings about digital identity. And I thought, I guess I'm the identity woman. So that's how it all got started. Today, I'm going to share with you about the true meaning of identity. And this is a, some guideposts for where we're going to go today, because I cover a lot of ground. First is some big concepts. I'm going to share a little bit about the history of identity and how that history led to some problems and challenges for your industry. Briefly, I want to touch on the opportunities that the new technologies I'll present to you um, also provide. It's not just solving problems. There's also opportunities. And finally, I'll close in talking a bit about trust. So in 2005, my colleagues and I began the Internet Identity Workshop. And in those 15 years, we've been grappling with both the philosophical questions around identity as well as the, as the practicalities of building these systems. And I'm going to talk to you about both today. So let's start off with the big questions. What is identity? This answer seems to cover most of them. Identity is socially constructed and contextual. This means we make it all up. We're born into the families we're born into. They help shape our identities within the societies that we are living in. And this is also true about the technical systems that we build. Today, I'll be talking about some of the history and the evolution of those technologies and also the future ones that we're making. We make it all up. We also end up with questions like, who am I? Who are you? And what is the true nat what's the nature of identity? And one of the earliest um, cones from Western philosophy about identity is the ship of Theseus. Theseus was the founder of Athens, and he won many naval battles, and the citizens wanted to honor him, so they created a memorial, and they had the ship in port. And then over a hundred years, different pieces of the ship rotted away, and they were replaced. And over that time, by the end of it, all the pieces of the ship had been replaced. And the question is, is it the same ship? And the answer is yes, because continuity of consciousness is what helps shape identity. And it is this one of the things that we're trying to get at with these emerging technologies is how do we know you're the same person over time? And how can you prove that in ways that really work? In banking, early, um, in, in early banking, identity was just based on local knowledge. It was based on who knew who in pretty local contexts. And in Europe, as people began to travel more and mercantilism emerged, systems of introduction based on the seals of local leaders came to be a practice of how people took their identity with them from one city to another. 
You also had in Europe the evolution of systems of birth registrations that were really just um, beginning with baptismal records and then with a local clerk in a city or town. These registers of who was born in the city were created and birth certificates were actually just a certificate that you had been registered in the register, right? <clears throat> this was also true of censuses that started to happen where censuses um, your identity documents were receipts for having been registered in a census. And birth registrations is actually an incredibly recent phenomena. You only had universal birth registration in the United States in 1930. And passports are also incredibly recent. They're Really, the first passports were really issued about 100 years ago, and they were not fully standardized until 1980. So we think of these documents as having been around for a long time, and they're really incredibly recent innovations. And they're also, if you notice in these pictures, they're paper. And you guys in this industry are spending a lot of money checking people's pieces of papers and trying to figure out whether they're real or not. And it's costing you a lot of money. In the US, the figure I pulled up was $24 billion a year. In the UK, $7 billion. And in several countries in Europe added together, $83 billion. It's huge. And figuring out a way to reduce this cost and have higher uh, believability in the documents you're actually seeing and having digitally native forms could be really valuable. Now, we're in Europe here. And you do have um, a whole set of work that's been done around EIDAS, Electronic Identification Systems. But there's over 200 of them. And they're incredibly complicated. And they really only work for government to government transactions. They're not really designed for citizens to use them across commercial contexts and in other places. So it's broken. And then once you do have an account, all of you are managing customer accounts, you have pretty limited security options. You can mail them a, to a dongle, a, a hardware token that they have to use every time they log in. We're doing mutual authentication by having owls looking back at our customers. And we're sticking cookies on their browser. And I think there needs to be an upgrade in all of this and looking at usable KYC, uh, usable um, public key encryption technology is, is a way through. And not only do you have to deal with the identities of people, you have to deal with the identities of corporations too. So those are created when individuals file paperwork and get um, papers of incorporation from whichever state they're filing under, and they get a number. And they also get secondary registrations from other institutions, like in the United States, a DUNS number, the legal entity identifier. And the question is, how are these managed in digital form? I recently opened up my own consultancy, and I had to take a giant stack of paper from the state of California to the bank, and they photocopied the whole thing to open my account. Where's the digital form of that set of paperwork from the government. It's not here yet. And then once you have a corporation and you're managing accounts for them, how do you as the bank know who has the authority to act on behalf of the company? Where's the digital trail that you can have confidence that that in fact is the CFO today and that they do have the authority to take the action they're taking with your bank. I wrote a report on non-person entity identity and the challenges in that space and that's where these diagrams are from. <clears throat> so we've got the internet. This is a sort of classical uh, uh, stack of all the pieces, the physical data link, network, transport, session, presentation, and application layer. And what's missing? What's missing, and it's been missing from the beginning, is this layer for people. And I'm going to make the case today that we're seeing the emergence of layer eight, a layer for people and for the identities of corporations and things that will enable 
the solving of all the problems I've named so far, plus open up new opportunities. And the new opportunity I want to propose to you is that you are in the business of helping people manage their money and get value from it, and that you could in the future, through these new technologies and these open standards, be in the business of helping people manage their data, becoming data banks and trusted intermediaries and brokers for people to get real value. And this logo is from the My Data Conference, also happening this week. I'm going there next. And it paints a picture of putting people at the center of their own data lives, where they're able to collect and get value from all the different realms of activity that they have. So next is the technology section. And I'm a big believer in actually trying to explain the details to you in a way that's understandable. In fact, some people say that's my special superpower as identity woman, is explaining these technologies to folks. And we're going to discuss how these new open standards create infinitely scalable, low-cost federation meaning you're going to be able to receive credentials from anyone and issue credentials to all the people that you care about in your business world without a huge new expense and without complex technical integrations. So at the heart of this new emerging layer of the internet is a simple number. It's called a decentralized identifier. This is an example of one. Um, and it's a really long number that you will probably never really read or pay attention or write down. So don't get too afraid. That's what new wallets and cell phones are for. So this is a number that you generate on your own device or if you're an enterprise like a bank on your own servers. It's self-generated identifier. And how is this different from other identifiers that we're used to? The thing is, it's you generate your own. You don't get them from somewhere else. Right now, in today's internet, you end up getting identifiers from lots of places. You have a Twitter handle, or a Gmail address, or a Facebook account. Those are all handed to you by those institutions, and they can take them away. You can also take away the bank accounts of your customers, right? You're handing them an account and, and delegating it to them, but ultimately you're the, the entity in control. And then you might be thinking, wait a second, what about phone numbers and domain names? Aren't those an alternative? Don't those provide identities that we could use for this? And the issue is that you rent your phone number and you rent every year to own a domain name. So yes, they're in global namespaces. They're not controlled by one entity. But you're, they're also not free and abundant, and they're a scarce resource, and everybody can't have one. So back to this, the decentralized identifier. It comes with two other numbers that are really important. One is a public key, and this is widely shareable. And the other is a private key. And they have a special relationship with each other. And if you want to learn more about the fancy cryptography that makes it possible, I'd recommend diving into it. But the summary is that if you share the public key and you use the algorithms that were used to create it to challenge the individual holding their private key, they can sign a response, prove that they're in control of the private key, but never reveal the actual number. So it means that new things are really possible. And the exciting thing about self-sovereign and decentralized identity is it allows this to finally be usable. This type of cryptography is 25 years old. But I believe we now have the opportunity to make this really usable by normal people. And we'll see some screenshots later on. So you've got a decentralized identifier, a public key, and a private key. For those of you paying attention to um, the blockchain space, like how is this different from what's going on in blockchain? In Bitcoin and Ethereum, your public key or a hash of your public key is your identifier. In this system, they're abstracted out. So you can have identifier 
that lasts for an incredibly long time, and you can rotate the keys over time and keep the persistence with the identifier, which is really critical if you're going to be anchoring important information to it. So another key piece of of this technology is what comes with the decentralized identifier, and it's a DID document. And in a DID document, you have the DID itself, and you have the public keys that I just described. You have the authentication protocols you use to challenge it, a set of service endpoints. So now you can actually have endpoints, and you can look up what the keys are you need to communicate with it, a timestamp for audit history, and a signature for integrity. So I want to walk through a scenario where an individual is using their decentralized identifier to get a credential, and then after that, use it. So the first step is for an individual to generate a decentralized identifier, to send it over to the institution, along with the DID document that contains the public keys. They're going to take that information and challenge the individual to prove that they are indeed in control of that decentralized identifier. And they're going to sign it with their private key, and they're going to send a response back. And the institution's going to go, great, OK, we know this decentralized identifier belongs to you. We're going to use it as the anchor identifier for a verifiable credential. And let's just say this is a state issuing a driver's license to someone, so they're going to anchor it to the decentralized identifier. They're going to add the claims like my address, my date of birth, my hair color, uh, that I'm allowed to drive a car. And they're going to add some metadata about the claim. And they're going to sign it with their private key. So they're going to seal this document up and the number at the bottom is going to be um, impossible to recreate unless you actually have their private key. So that is what makes up a verifiable credential. Now, this signature by the issuer, it's really critical. They also have a public key, and they need to share that so that folks checking the credential can find it. So they're going to create their own decentralized identifier document, and they're going to post it to a blockchain. So after they've done that, they're, we're going to go back to the story of the individual receiving this credential from the institution issuing it. So now the individual has their driver's license in their digital wallet. So now they want to go to a bank. Oh, there it is. So they've got it. Now they want to go to a bank. And the bank's like, who are you? And they send over the verifiable credential they got from the state, their driver's license. And they go, OK, thanks for sharing. But we need to check a few things first. They're going to challenge the individual to see if they actually are the owner of that decentralized identifier that's the anchor for the credential. They're going to do a, di uh, oh, a did auth challenge. The individual is going to sign it with their private key and send it back. So they're like, great, you are the owner of this. This credential was issued to you. Now they need to check another thing. They need to check this issuer's signature. And what they're going to do is go to the blockchain, look it up, and see that there is a match. So now they know that this came from the institution that, that it's supposed to have come from, and that the person hasn't altered the credential. So The individual has managed to take a credential from the state and through their own wallet share it with the bank. And they do so using the blockchain as the intermediary, this writable ledger in the sky that 
folks can post to and anyone can read. And what it means is that if you can issue verifiable credentials and you can accept verifiable credentials, you can accept them from anyone who's issuing in this open standards format. And what doesn't have to happen is technical federation between these two institutions. You, the bank, do not have to phone home through complex middleware and EIDAS to go and ask the state if this is a real document. You just can read the signatures on the verifiable credential. So that's how we can have infinitely large, low-cost federation is by following these new emerging open standards to support the exchange of credentials. And I want to contextualize open standards a little bit because I think their value is not really uh, touted enough. But open standards are the basis of modern infrastructure. And these are some photos of Roman roads that you can still see today. It's a type of infrastructure that was built 2,000 years ago and we can still see. And it became the basis of the freeway system. And also, railway networks began to be built on these same lines. And with railway networks, a whole set of standards emerged around the gauge of the tracks and the parts. And and it became standardized to run efficiently. Another thing that happened with the invention of the railroads was time. So in North America, it was originally that each railway line had its own time, and every town had its own time. And figuring out when the train was coming, really hard. And somebody had the idea in the 1880s to say, like, wait a second, why don't we divide the country up into time zones and have that whole zone operate on the same time so we can more easily schedule and know when trains were coming and going. This is a type of infrastructure we rely on every day, and we don't really think of it anymore. And this is a type of infrastructure with communications technologies that we also have. So this is a early... Um, map of telegraph lines throughout Europe. And this is the telegraph uh, network that formed around the world. So in 1865, the um, International Telecommunications Union was formed to develop the open standards to support communications across this global network. And it then became the institution that standardized the phone system when it was innovated. So standards play a critical role in enabling commerce and supporting um, business as we know it. This is a really fun map that I found from the Bureau of Standards in the United States, outlining all the different things that they were seeking to standardize to enable commerce. And today we have the National Institute of Standards in the US and a range of similar bodies around the world that also do this type of standardization. The internet. So we already had the stack of the internet, but the internet began in 1969 and steadily grew. And it built a set of institutions to manage those standards as well. The Internet Engineering Task Force and the W3C when the web emerged. So it's in this, this, le in this legacy of standardization that the work that we're doing fits in and it is a new layer of the internet for DIDs, verifiable credentials, and did auth that's emerging. And work's being done actively right now to standardize this at the W3C and potentially other standards bodies as well. So I want to get to the practical, because I'm imagining that you might think, oh, this is all really great theory, but like, who's really doing it? So the province of British Columbia has been a leader and innovator in the space. And they saw the possibility of leveraging this technology to actually credential all the businesses in the province with their own incorporation papers. So they are supporting business owners getting digital certificates 
being able to share those with banks and other institutions, and then being able to have them verified in the way I just described earlier. They, they, each issuer of a credential packages up the uh, definition of the credentials that they're issuing and also posts that to the ledger, so they're look upable. And so this is a much prettier version of what I described earlier. You have the province being able to issue to our business owner a credential, and they're able to share them with banks and other service providers. And this is their term for the blockchain, or the register of identifiers. <coughs> They also have been collaborating with the province of Ontario, and they're supporting business owners coming to one place and picking up all the credentials for their business, all the different licenses that they issue in the province for having a liquor license if you're a restaurant and a health permit. They are reducing people's paperwork, so they're not even like implementing this and saying, well, you go get all the credentials. They've pulled them all together into their business registry, and you can actually go and look this up online. So I just showed you one real example, and there's a few more I want to share. Alberta has created a credentials ecosystem. Recently, the Department of Homeland Security, Science, and Technology issued a Silicon, Silicon Valley innovation program call for startups implementing these new standards that solve business problems for the federal government. And they're, they're giving grants over several years of up to $800,000 to implement them. They also recently released this, a taxonomic approach to understanding emerging blockchain identity management systems. So if you want to um, get into, remember our friends at NIST, so this is part of the process of standardization sharing these terms and inviting people to understand them and implement them. You also have this known traveler report from the World Economic Forum written by Accenture that outlines a vision of how people can use digital credentials like their passport and their visa to cross borders. And the Dutch government this summer at ID for Africa announced that it was doing an early stage pilot to actually support this type of border crossing for its citizens. And the Canadian government has really led the way in terms of building another type of infrastructure needed to get this all to work, which is frameworks for figuring out whether you can believe any of these credentials that are issued. So now I want to share with you some really simple screenshots. The technology I described before may seem really complicated with all those public keys and private keys and dids and did documents. But the good news is, is when they end up being put into the user interfaces for people to use, they're really simple. So the CU Ledger is a credit union network in the United States, and they've been implementing these technologies. And they've been really excited about the potential to have higher security between their customers and their bank because of the public key encryption that's now available. And what they've done is support um, their call centers being able to challenge their customers via the app on their phone using this technology when they call the call center. Because they're not that big. Each credit union is really small. They've pooled on the R&D. And so when Alice calls her credit union, Suncoast, they actually send a message to her phone using this underlying technology to ask Alice if she's on the phone. And if she says she's not, they don't talk to her. And if she says she does, they do. She's being asked to share an authentication. These are, these are like the cards in her wallet. And she's asked to pick one. And she sends it over. And it says, OK. I was really skeptical when my community came up with these big ideas with all this cryptography several years ago. And what really sold me was like the user experience can be really amazingly simple, and the technology and the security it provides very high. So I'm really optimistic about where these can go. So those of you paying attention and thinking about these problems, 
realize that there's only some parts of trust that are solved with technology alone. So I'm not going to, I've talked about technical trust already, which is like the confidence in the signatures and being able to move information that you can believe around. But what's needed is other, how do you know that that is the province of British Columbia or the province of Alberta or one of the credit unions in the CU Ledger Network? You have to have mesh networks of authority, of pointers at these institutions to figure out who's true, who, who's actually real. And your industry is very used to these things called trust frameworks. They're at the core of the credit card networks. And a lot of work's being done to consider how similar frameworks for believing institutions are who they say they are coming into being in this industry. But we must step back and ask this question, what is trust? Trust operates at many different scales. And for this section, I'm going to draw on the work of Stephen Covey and his book, The Speed of Trust, because he's one of the best explainers of this whole range of trust. It isn't one thing. So there is trust that starts with ourselves with our capacity to be honest with ourselves and to um, manage our own actions in the world. There's relationship trust in how we connect to and relate to other people and growing that. There's organizational trust, how groups work together. And market trust, this is how you all do business with other institutions, and you're operating with each other in a way that you can trust. And you have, as deep backup, societal trust, meaning court systems and dispute resolution mechanisms and law enforcement that are hopefully operating in ways that you can trust to support resolution of conflict. And banks, as a whole, are operating with organizational trust, market trust, and societal trust, they're not really in the business of interpersonal relations. So the Canadians have been doing a lot of amazing work in this field. They developed what they called the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework to support all the players in the new emerging identity ecosystem being able to have trust in one another. So they have claims holders, claims consumers, infrastructure providers, and claims providers. And what they've done is break down into really atomic little bits the different processes needed for things like identity assurance and credential, credential issuance. And this is what you do every time you're doing a KYC. Is you're trying to figure out, is that really the identity of the person presenting it. So in their model, they have an object input state, a trusted process, and an object output state. And they've developed 24 of these. So here's one example. An unconfirmed identity goes through an identity validation and becomes a confirmed identity. An authenticator-bound credential goes through credential authentication and becomes an authenticated credential. And a consent decision has a record of consent and then is a stored consent decision. So there's 24 of these. I'm not going to go through all of them. But they're incredible piece of work to really break down into little tiny pieces all the steps you need to go through to do things like identity confirmation. So on this one side, you have an unconfirmed identity. If you do all five of these steps, you can have a confirmed identity on the other side. And they've also done this for identity assurance and for informed consent. And they've published all of this and made it available. And they're building consensus across the range of credential issuers. Because in Canada, you have 13 provinces and territories and a federal government plus a whole range of private sector actors. And how do they actually know that a credential from one province 
has conformed to these types of standards or another, when, when being received in another or from an institution. And they're all agreeing to follow these processes and track them, and so they can have confidence in each other's credentials. And people don't have to get yet more of them. So it's through this, through both the, the, ver the decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials and these emerging trust frameworks that um, you're going to be able to significantly reduce your KYC, IML, ATF costs and comply with all the FATF regulations. Now, these types of practices have three of the behaviors of trust. They're about confronting reality, creating transparency, and practicing accountability. So I'm going to reference back to the work of our friend Stephen Covey and his work on trust and, and challenge this word because he outlines 12 different behaviors that generate trust and only three of them apply to all this veracity of claims work relative to KYC, et cetera. And that we really have to be careful when using this word trust and I actually want to make this case that we should stop using it when we're talking about these emerging frameworks for managing credentials and their veracity. And we should start calling them accountability or governance frameworks because trust is a human feeling and it's based on a whole complex set of behaviors that are really interpersonal with people and that this is a much better term for how we talk about this emerging complex set of technologies and governance frameworks. So with that, um, I've shared with you the true meaning of identity. Um, there's a lot of philosophical questions that are totally worth exploring more. I hope I've inspired you to look at these new emerging technologies and uh, the way that they're coming together to form a new layer of the internet that will both reduce costs, but also if this formats become widely available and ubiquitous, open up new opportunities for data banking and data exchange. Um, and if you are here, it means you're aware of InnoTribe and the place that our community is really innovating at is the Internet Identity Workshop that I still host twice a year. So you're all invited to join us there. And finally, I've put links to all of the interesting things I shared up on my blog. I'll be posting that just after I get off the stage here. So thank you very much, and have a great rest of Cybos.